Stage, please. So the medical technology sector has certainly been um, a growing sector in Ontario, um, one that I think has, uh, has benefited incredibly from the convergence of our strengths in the, um, in the IT and manufacturing spaces along with the health technology spaces. And it really has been um, a driver of growth within uh, the life sciences industry. So it's my pleasure today to have a dedicated panel around um, medical technologies. And our moderator is John Solaninka, um, President and CEO of HTX, the Health Technology Exchange. I've known John for a number of years now. Um, he is um, articulate, well-spoken, knowledgeable, and uh, opinionated as well, which makes him a wonderful moderator um, um, for the topics of uh, pu public policy um, and the interface with industry and science. So please join me in welcoming John to the podium. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I have no opinions. I'm completely objective. Um, this is a great uh, honor to be here. Thank you very much. And um, I would, uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, with our panel, uh, Brian Lewis, the President and CEO of MEDEC, the Industry Association for Medical Technology in Canada. Alex Long, General Manager of Alcon Canada. And Vela, uh, Vera Belisov, uh, VP of Corporate Development, Silegis Devices, Inc. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, one of our other panel members, uh, Chris Shaw of Bayless Medical, is unable to be here. Um, but we certainly have amongst us, and, and I can certainly take some positions if I need to, uh, we have uh, lots of meat here. And in fact, I was listening to the earlier panels. Uh, Dr. Bitran's uh, talk was, uh, was excellent and, and spot on, uh, and it's very, very relevant for what we're doing. Uh, for those of you who come from the pharma industry um, and who, who do not have a lot of interaction with med tech, uh, I think there are some, certainly commonalities with pharma, but there are some substantial differences. And we're in a privileged position in the medtech industry that we've got a huge amount of momentum over the last several years, which I will talk about briefly, and then get some feedback from the panel. Um, there's a, a, a Chinese uh, phrase, you know, it, it's almost a threat, may you, or a, a, a curse, may you live in interesting times. Well, in fact, the times in medtech are counter to that, uh, to that threat, the, the times are very interesting now. Um, uh, healthcare, uh, the healthcare sector, the innovation sector, the economic development sector, and so on are converging. Definitely Ontario, but also around the world in the med tech sector. And this has to be the case. In other words, the improvement of the healthcare system has to be a driver of economic development. Why? If you're spending 50% of your government dollars on, uh, on the healthcare sector, uh, and you're not using that uh, for a double or triple bottom line, then that's not responsible use of, of government dollars. So the good news in, in the med tech sector, the Ontario Health Innovation Council, which is uh, representatives, representatives of the payers, the healthcare system, uh, government, industry, uh, and healthcare system, uh, both hospitals, home care, and so on, all focused on trying to help the healthcare system solve its problems and in parallel create economic development in Ontario. We've got Dave Williams. Now, I, I couldn't make this up. I could not make this up. NASA astronaut, physician, uh, uh, emergency physician, CEO of a hospital, specialist in innovation from NASA, is the chair of OHIC. I mean, isn't that an incredible situation? We've got Dr. Bob Bell, formerly CEO of, uh, uh, of UHN, who is now the Deputy Minister of Health in Ontario. Uh, we have institutions like Excite, uh, my own institution, HTX, the Ontario Brain Institute, innovation procurement things, uh, innovation procurement initiatives uh, ongoing, helping the healthcare system adopt innovation, which is something it hasn't done well uh, uh, before. So this is all great news. Uh, but as I said uh, to Tatum, uh, who is the, uh, the uh, uh, Premier's uh, 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 envoy, uh, I said it's sort of like setting up 
on beautiful tees on a beautiful golf course and lining up a whole bunch of uh, you know, Tiger Woods equivalent uh, talented players behind it ready to tee off, but they haven't been allowed to yet step up and actually take those drives. But, but compare this with five years ago. Five years ago, we had none of what I just said, absolutely none of what I just said. We uh, have done tremendous investment and so on. So it's a great time to be in MedTech in Ontario. And what we're really here to talk about is what policies are necessary or what actions are necessary in the policy and implementation environment to make all this great momentum become great impact. Um, and so what I'd like to do, uh, I've got several questions that I'd like to ask each of the, uh, uh, each of the uh, panelists to respond to. Um, and uh, I'd also, you, you have their bios there, but if there's, uh, you know, by all means, panelists, uh, let us know uh, something about your organization, how it's relevant to Ontario, LSO, and, and so on. Um, but what I'd like to start off with is, uh, is specifically on this, we've got this great momentum, I think you might agree with that, but what would be the number one thing that would demonstrate in this next year that we've moved from just momentum and policy to actually having impact. What would be that one thing that you'd like to see this year? And I'll follow up with several other questions later. But let's start with, uh, with Brian. Yeah, John, I think if OHIC comes out with a recommendation for a, an office of innovation with a senior government official um, in, in that role, uh, that uh, crosses both health and economic uh, development and research and innovation, I think that would be a great start because the, the trick is going to be in implementation. And we can, we can come up with recommendations and policies, but uh, we need to ensure that, uh, that there is a, a mechanism for implementing uh, the ideas. Does this work? I'd rather sit down. Does this work? Yes, it does. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. And, and we'll follow up. We'll follow up on on uh, on OHIC in a minute. But that I th I I think that's a great suggestion, Alex. Yeah, I think from uh, from my perspective, uh, maybe a little more clarity around the procurement process. I know one of the the uh, biggest challenges we face is uh, Ontario buys is is obviously fantastic guidance, but there seems to be different interpretation of, the, of that guidance uh, depending on the buying group. And I think there's a real opportunity for uh, education at the buying group level, at the hospital administration level to make sure there is more consistency. And um, as an example, um, when it comes to uh, assessing uh, a different products that are out there, obviously there's emphasis on price, there's emphasis on technology, there's em emphasis on service and some other parameters as well. But really the weighting, at least from what we've seen recently, there seems to be the most emphasis by far placed on price and certainly understand the benefits of that. But I think there are a lot of challenges with that as well. And uh, clearly, one of those challenges not being able to truly differentiate one technology from another. And I think the other challenge that that potentially uh, possesses or, or potentially uh, creates, I should say, for Ontario is less competition, right? So less companies that could potentially enter Canada. Uh, so the creation of, of, uh, of not as much competition, and if it continues, the fear is that you could actually have some companies exiting uh, the province, and uh, that's clearly not a good thing. Uh, uh, and Vera, I'll make some comments after. Vera, your thoughts? So um, I have slightly different issues when it comes to the Ontario marketplace and the Canadian marketplace. We are, Selegis Devices, a small medical device company that has developed a non-invasive device that is cardioprotective. Um, we are small, and while I can understand what the drivers of uptake are in certain countries in Europe and definitely in the United States, I cannot understand what the drivers of uptake are in Ontario. I don't know where the money's flowing. I don't know who's accountable. I don't know what people are being measured on. If I look at the United States, there's 30-day readmission rates and the reduction in those numbers 
are a very great driver for me to develop a business model to go to the hospital administrators or the insurance companies and say, here's the economic benefits that you can get from using our device. Or go to CMS. Here are the long-term clinical benefits that you can get from using our device. This is not apparent in, in Ontario. So I would request clarity um, as to who are the decision-making units, um, who has responsibility, who has accountability, and how can one navigate the system? So I'll, I'll be a little bit provocative. Uh, the, the, the comments that were made here about uh, procurement and then how does one get into the system, there, there are two sides of, of a similar coin. Um, the MedTech Working Group, which uh, Brian and, and a whole bunch of us have been working on, has really come across this issue whereby in other countries, if you generate specific ed evidence according to specific pathways demonstrating a certain level of value or perceived value, then you get into the system and you get used. And it's, it's just a lockstep method. Others are more informal, but still you can see that method working. Ontario uh, and Canada uh, generally, but Ontario specifically, is one of those markets where that process is, is hidden. It, do, it does exist, but it's, it's hidden. And it's unclear whether that, and here's the provocative comment, it's unclear whether um, uh, you know, that's for inadvertent reasons or deliberate reasons, uh, because you could, in fact, use access to technology as a way of controlling cost, mm -hmm. as well as uh, you know, inadvertently looking at certain things, as you were saying. You know, the, the inadvertent aspects of, uh, of procurement methods, which are designed to achieve one thing, but inadvertently achieve another. An example of that, I presented at the um, uh, HN, uh, hospital HSCN. supply chain network, HSCN, HSCN conference. And prior to my present, uh, which was, innovation was really interesting there, which is the first time in 10 years that it's been interesting uh, to them. But uh, Matt Anderson spoke before me, and he said, the procurement world has done a great job of minimizing unit cost. You've done a great job doing that, but that's now not our challenge. Our challenge is, how do we buy innovation? So both of uh, your comments are, are, are highly relevant. And this, uh, this innovation chair that OHIC is rumored to be suggesting, um, that person has to get responsibility and authority to actually act. So on, on OHIC, uh, and we could talk a lot about the, those topics, but on OHIC specifically, the Ontario Health Innovation Council, which has drafted but not yet released its recommendations on how should we reform the healthcare system to do some of the things that you guys are saying. Uh, you mentioned one, which is to this innovations arm. Um, if you were looking at that document right now and having been happy that you read it, what might be the, like beyond that one, what, what are the other things that you would like to see in those OHIC recommendations? What do you think the province should be doing in those, uh, in those recommendations to really have impact? Sure. Vera, go first. Vera? I think that one of the things that would be speaking from the perspective of, of a small company looking to start commercialization, I think one of the things that would be useful if there were some adoption money for innovation that is new, that is disruptive, and that has no performance, no um, provider reimbursement, no reimbursement at all, because if you're doing something new, there's no code that it exists for it. So there is, even though I can say that our device can save the system money, there's still going to be somebody paying for it up front. And the fragmentation of the system means that if the product is deployed in the ambulance, which are funded by the municipalities, with some throw in from the provincial government, and the benefit accrues to the hospital, it's very difficult to convince one person to spend money when they're going to be reducing their revenue in the future because those are not going to be repeat customers for them. No. So if there is a pot of money where um, com uh, hospitals or other healthcare provider institutions could access, say, I have an innovative product and I want to trial it, there's no codes, and I'm just going to do a field trial, I mean, that would be very helpful. Alex? 
I think, you know, I, I get back to the procurement process, and I uh, just to echo what I said, I think there's a real need to educate um, the uh, buying groups as well as hospitals on uh, what the process should look like, because as you can imagine, anytime you put a document together, a very broad document, there's a lot of black and white, but there's a lot of gray as well. So how should certain things be interpreted? Uh, what is the best way to not only get the best value for money as far as driving price down? And I agree with the comment completely, John. The, the process has done a great job of reducing price. Mm -hmm. But what it has done is it's uh, not uh, it's done it in a way where uh, it doesn't discern technology. And I think there's a real need to be able to not only drop price down, but at the same time be able to differentiate types of technology and service from different providers. So ultimately, um, if that happens, then uh, hospitals and buying groups can make sure that, uh, that physicians and patients are getting the best technology at the best price with the best service and not having to make sacrifices. Brian? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I want to build a little bit on both what Alex and, and Vera were saying. And just for some people in the room, to give you a little bit more background, John mentioned procurement. Procurement of medical devices, you know, most medical devices now are procured by, for use in hospitals. And that procurement process goes through shared service organizations, there's multiple in Ontario, or through group purchasing organizations. And th the process was put in place, we all know that our healthcare system is stretched. It was stretched financially 10 years ago, and it's still stretched financially. So there's a mandate, if you will, by hospital uh, administrators to reduce costs. That pressure has been there, and it's been there for a while. So a number of years ago, what was put in place is the uh, broader public uh, service pr uh, procurement directive that looked at uh, methodologies for group purchasing. And the focus, as Alex has been alluding to, was to drop price, to get price to the lowest level. In the early days, as medical device companies were brought forward in front of, uh, of uh, these shared service organizations, I think synergies were squeezed out of this, uh, were taken out of the system. But the situation hasn't gone away, is that medical devices are less than 5% of the expenditures in the healthcare system. The healthcare system is still stretched and stressed. So what's happening is, is that the uh, shared services organizations are looking for ways to drive more synergies out of the medical device marketplace, and it's not there. It was like Alex was talking about, some of the rules are changing, things are being perceived in a different way, and so what, what, what's ended up is a situation that's very tight. The end result is, is the competitiveness for multinational organizations has been really, really tough. But the fact of the matter is for Canadian-based organizations, as, as Virus, they, they sell 80 to 100% of their products outside of Canada and just don't even bother, in some cases, trying to get business in Canada. So I'm building towards something. Sorry, I just wanted to give you a bit of context, and then I'll answer John's. Uh, you want to add something? I, I was just going to add one thing. I think to that very point, uh, Brian, if, if you survey the landscape and you look at, at Europe, as an example, Western Europe, uh, at least within the industry that uh, that I uh, that my company happens to be in, which is the eye care industry, you will find more companies that compete in that particular space. And within Canada, there are just three. And we haven't seen those uh, some of those other companies that are primarily based in Europe enter Canada, even though they're starting to enter the U.S. And I think part of it is they just don't know how to get into the market. Right. Barriers to entry. Exactly. So, but John, to get to your question, what, what we have been talking for a while, because John's right, there has been success out there. We are, as an industry, moving forward. This isn't a doom and gloom scenario. Things are going forward. It's going to take time. But I think from uh, our opinion uh, is that value for money versus price. The focus on short-term price and cost in one department in the hospital, rather than looking at, th at outcomes, looking a bit uh, better at pa uh, better patient outcomes, at the impact on the cost to the system, Vera, something that you were talking about, rather than the cost within one department. That's what I'd like to see OHIC uh, focus on because we can't use pharmaceutical-based HTA, and Jason, you may say, well, we don't like what's there either. But that particular process, we need to do something different for medical devices that takes into account the unique nature of all the different sectors, the different classes of agents, and the degree of innovation that's there in, in order to, and the life cycle. There are 5,000 medical devices approved in Canada every year. 
up to 5,000. So that's a significant amount of products, and you have to pick and choose the ones and the, and the amount of data that you want. The focus needs to be on knowledge, not data, and moving to better patient outcomes and, uh, and value for money rather than just price. And, um, um, and so I'll answer something else a little later. I just want to make one other comment about something that's going on. Later. Oh, okay. I can do it later. Oh, later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, really important topics, and I think uh, I'd just like to focus a little bit on one of them, which is um, uh, this concept of what we, what we call the cross-silo uh, benefits model. So in other words, uh, like a hospital has to pay $1,000 more in order to save thirty dollars or $40,000 in aftercare after the hospital. And the healthcare system would benefit dramatically from that, especially if it was a technology that was developed at University of Western Ontario and built here and can be sold all over the world. But right now, we do not have any form of cross-silo reimbursement. Your ambulance example is, is a good one. Uh, uh, also rural and remote communities, federal, provincial. Absolutely. So, so this is, this is a, a very big problem. It's a, it's a cross-silo problem. I think it's going to be one that's going to be solved later <laughs> in the sense that it, it's not necessarily the one that you could solve right now. But I think one of the other ones that was mentioned is, you know, when you think about um, uh, uh, global budgets reimbursement, right now with global budgets, you don't have, as they do in other countries, you don't have reimbursement related to a technology. So that if I'm, I'm let's say I'm funding the old technology at $1,000 a pop, and there's a brand new technology well, what if I want to fund that one at 1000 and drop the reimbursement of this one to 500 because I want to encourage adoption of the new one. All we do now is this one's 1000 and this other one comes in at 1000 as well, and, and they'll probably both be used. Right. So that, that there, I mean, there are many challenges of that type. Yeah, and I was just going to make yeah, one please. comment to that point, John. I think that's, that's a, another point, uh, an excellent point. One of the things I can see as, some, uh, as technology continues to advance, uh, again, I'm thinking of my own specific industry, but there are a lot of new technologies from a, uh, from a glaucoma surgical perspective. So treating the disease of glaucoma via surgical procedure. And today, glaucoma is primarily treated via topical medications. Mm -hmm. So uh, as some of this technology advances to the point where it could move up in the treatment paradigm and potentially be more of a primary therapy, the cost for glaucoma surgical procedures would go up. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it could reduce medication costs Absolutely. to the government. Yep. So that's the challenge is how do you uh, ultimately, where do you go to have that conversation of it's going to reduce the overall health care costs, but you're essentially having to talk to two different people to, or two different groups to convince them of that? Well, frankly, prior to the existence of OHIC, um, there was virtually no one to talk to. And, and I think, and, and I'm not 100% I'm not convinced that OHIC has the uh, 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 power to, to solve some of those problems, but at least it is a forum for discussion. Uh, which is a challenge. Um, one of the, th uh, one of the uh, aspects you mentioned about Ontario buys, in fact, there are initiatives going on now that try to connect the pathway from research and development, so from invention, innovation, <coughs> clinical evidence generation, and then what? Go to the other countries and sell your product? Mm -hmm. Well, actually trying to get it used and purchased in the context of Ontario and then with that as a launch customer, then going elsewhere, which is very important. Um, we are actually in the process of putting together some funds to do exactly what you were saying, which is helping uh, providers test products, innovative products, and purchase them. So uh, this is something, you know, stay tuned. It's not done yet, but stay tuned that it's coming. But, but this, um, this is a segue to another issue, which is, we often talk about, well, if the product was good enough, then it, the market would uh, you know, support it, whether it's VCs or whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's the, the company. Well, let me just remind everyone of a program called SBIR in the United States, which gives companies millions of dollars to bring their products to market. The SBRI in the UK, which gives 200,000 £200, pounds for a proof of concept, 2.4 million pounds for development and 2.4 million pounds for implementation in their own country, okay? So this idea that it's all the capitalist system, in the early stages, high risk, yet high benefit to the healthcare system, we actually need government engagement in that process. We're an example of that government engagement, but I think we need more of that. 
But I, I'm, I'm interested to ask the question of you. I just mentioned two programs in US and, and UK. Uh, what are other things that you've seen in the rest of the world that you think are best practices that we don't do here, but you think would be good to do here? You want me to um, yeah. start? Is I, I happened to be at a conference uh, a number of months ago where I met the director of innovation from um, uh, NHS uh, in the UK. And what they've done there is they have put in place an office of innovation and they have started working down the process to say, how do you determine value for money? And what's a quicker way, a more efficient way to do it to get to the knowledge that's needed to show that that particular product will result in better outcomes for the patient across therapeutic areas. So they've had that, that office in effect for just over two years now. The other thing they've done is they've put in place um, clinical uh, networks physicians and other clinicians that are involved in the adoption of the product. So it gets back to not just policy, but what's important after policy are the regs, the programs and practices that you put in place. So they're doing it. Alberta is involved in deep conversations about doing the same thing. Yep. They call it scientific clinical networks. Yep. Unfortunately, the top of the food chain got blown up there when there was a change in, in government and all the, uh, uh, the Minister of Health, who was a brilliant man and an economist, was shoved out, out of his portfolio. It slowed them down a little bit, but they've got uh, what's called Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. They've got a body that's like we're talking about with an innovative office here that's driving the process out there, bottom up, and top down. And uh, the other thing I just want to mention, John, is, is that for uh, value for money, they've got a process that's called medical technology briefings. And I know it doesn't deal with pharma, it deals just with medical devices. But it's a 12-week evaluation process that says, will this offer value and value for money over existing therapies as they go through the process, not just the price? Yeah, I think to that point, um, I, I think any time we can define specific parameters of what's needed in order to uh, uh, have a technology reimbursed and uh, defining what, to uh, what type of value for money uh, government expects to see, I think that it will inspire more research to be done within the province and ultimately, uh, you know, a better technology or more innovative technology to be introduced in the province as well. Vera? And I think in, in Europe there are innovation funds where doctors, even though, for example, in Belgium, um, TAVR, which is the, the valve replacements, the new valve replacement therapies that are coming out, um, is not reimbursed. But they're one of the largest users of the technology because there are innovation funds that exist where the doctors can access that pot of money um, to, to, to use the procedure on, on their qualifying patients. And, and in Germany, it's pretty much the same thing, except they're, you know, uh, one of the highest users of the technology because the doctors see the value in it. So I think there are different mechanisms that can be uh, put in place. There are government levers that can be put in place in terms of CMS does it all the time. I'll reimburse you more for this and I'll cut the reimbursement for that, and it's a blunt tool, but it's very effective. But let, let's just keep in mind that in Ontario, I mean, it's a great point. In Ontario, um, we don't actually reimburse specific devices for, uh, we do sometimes, but generally we don't. It's, uh, there's a particular, like, surgical procedure code, and then a device is used within that procedure code, or it's within a global budget, or whatever. Other countries have the advantage in that they do do specific reimbursement of specific technologies. Uh, and this puts us at a disadvantage. I might also say that uh, I saw some data recently that we are 23rd of 25 OEDC countries in our adoption of, uh, of, uh, of medical technologies. That's pathetic uh, because we're, we're not getting the value that is represented there, but we're also not generating the economic value from encouraging technologies to be adopted in this way. Um, speaking of economic value, and you mentioned doing clinical trials here, uh, I, I'm leading a, a group right now that is uh, uh, putting together a, a clinical research network across Ontario, and our goals are to try and compete with the best in the world. I was talking to a, a multinational just the other day, and they said, we do great medical research in Ontario, but I compete with Australia and mm -hmm. Poland and everywhere else for the internal multinational research dollars. And I'd love to give a great business case for Ontario, but right now Australia is kicking our butt. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is, is create that 
that uh, clinical research capability here. And um, Nature Biotech came out with a, a report about uh, six months ago, I guess, or maybe less, that said governments and elsewhere focus on startup companies. They focus on building startup companies. Not necessarily realizing that those startup companies can go anywhere. They can, they can move, their technology can move. But the clinical research infrastructure, the ecosystem that's necessary to spawn and nurture these companies, that doesn't tend to move. It's, it's in the universities, it's in the physical locations. So therefore, governments should be funding the development of those, those infrastructures. And Clinical Trials Ontario is a good example of that. The stuff we're working on is, is a good example of that. I'm interested to know your views of the role that CROs, or and I use that term broadly, academic CROs, private CROs, that, that you see um, in your company or company's choices to do work in Ontario or to do work elsewhere. How healthy do you think that CRO network is in Ontario and what would you recommend about it? Well, I just want to make a comment first about Australia. I can attest to this because I got an email the other day saying, I'm looking at uh, how can I get your device to do a field implementation trial in Australia. We're not approved in Australia, right? But I have not yet gotten any email from any Canadian institution reaching out to our web info line saying, how can I use your device? Hmm. So as a little company, I have to say that when we make decisions about where we put our energies, we have to look to see where the barriers are the highest and where they are the lowest. And unfortunately, we cannot be profitable based on Ontario. We can't, there's not the population base and we'd have to get absolute widespread coverage. It's a very geographically dispersed. We're a small company. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna to have to make some hard decisions about where we're gonna spend our money. And south of the border is basically one system that if we get into it, we understand how to, how to tap into it. And, and I, I want to do work in Canada mm -hmm. where the technology is out of sick kids. We manufacture here in Toronto. We're the poster child. Mm -hmm. But we have an innovative technology and the government doesn't really know that they need us. So how do we get the year of government? And I suppose this is one way to do it, sitting up here yeah, on yeah, a yeah. panel and talking about it. But you know, it is a question, how does the next company do it? Well, the healthcare system doesn't have a way of realizing hard dollar value from your technology, even though your technology is clinical, I know the technology well, uh, even though that technology gives great benefit to patients, the healthcare system itself can't extract those benefits necessarily, or doesn't know. I did it for them. I'm sorry? Yeah. I did it for them. For every 100 patients you treat, you save $400,000 at the end of one year. So I've done it for you. The value's there, but how the can we actually there. Extract it is the, is, the, is, the, is the challenge. Alex, you were going to say? Yes, I was just going to say that I can give the other perspective. So, um, you know, as a Alcon, a large multi, mu multinational organization, uh, we don't, uh, we, we certainly use a lot of CROs, but we do a lot of research ourselves. And one of the things that our organization looks for are um, centers, academic institutions, hospitals where they can build long-term relationships with that offer more than just one particular specialty, one particular sub-segment. And I think Canada, quite frankly, is well-positioned. Uh, I can look at uh, plenty of hospitals um, and uh, uh, institutes uh, across Ontario where we could go and do many different types of research, whether that be cataract surgery or retina surgery or cornea surgery or pediatric ophthalmology and uh, establish a very good relationship with one institution to continue to do multiple types of research. So I think Ontario is actually well positioned and one of the things that I have been doing along with many of my colleagues within uh, Alcon Canada is putting pressure on uh, my, off, or, or my organization to do more research in Ontario and we've seen a significant increase in the past uh, 18 months. So, uh, and I, I believe that will continue. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> and um, uh, to comment on 
numerous other multinational organizations where the uh, opinions vary a little bit uh, as well. And my previous experience in the pharmaceutical world is Canada, Ontario, is known for the quality of its research around the world. It absolutely is considered to be second to none uh, in any international organization that I've sat in and, and spoken with. Um, for some of our organizations, it was what we were talking about earlier. When you go back to your boardroom, Canada's less than 2% of the world, and it's if the inability or difficulty or a number of barriers, whatever way you want to put it, of getting the product uh, adopted and diffused, commercialized in Canada versus some other markets in the world. So if another market in the world, if their science, their ability to conduct science is close, um, I don't think there's many that are better than us. Um, then they'll look at that particular marketplace and, they'll, and it'll end up in a decision uh, of going to that particular market. Yeah. Just, uh, I'm sorry, John, I was going to make one other comment along these lines. I think uh, another challenge that we face as far as research is concerned is, uh, you know, we obviously uh, want to do more research in Ontario, but we have a lot of different types of medical devices. Some of those would be considered medically necessary and insured services, and some of those would be not medically necessary or uninsured services. And I think the pathway of uninsured services uh, is not as clear as it can be to uh, many of the institutions as well as physicians. And so there's a little bit of reluctancy. Well, do we want to do that research in Canada or do we want to do that research somewhere else? Uh, and uh, I w that's one of the things I would like to see is a, a little bit more clarity around uh, uninsured uh, services and consistency around uninsured <coughs> services uh, to where uh, they, they, there is not that uh, roadblock because I don't think there should be that roadblock to doing that type of research here in Ontario. Or, or doing research that, that in fact takes into account the requirements of other international markets, generates endpoints and outcomes in the evidentiary package from Ontario research that's relevant to Japan, that's relevant to Germany, that's Absolutely. relevant to elsewhere, as opposed to just doing work that's relevant to Ontario. Mary, you were I just wanted to make another comment. We're involved in a lot of investigator-initiated trials. We are in over, we're in several multi-thousand multi-center trials in Europe. And we have some work going in Ontario as well. And hands down, Europe is a better climate for multi-center trials. There is better cooperation between organizations. And we're talking seven countries, 70 centers. And th how these people organized themselves and how they got through all their intra-country, intra-institutional barriers, REBs, whatever, is, is just smooth like silk compared to uh, some of the trials and tribulations that we see here in, in Ontario. So uh, uh, Susan Marlin and Clinical Trials Ontario and our own collaboration, which we're currently calling the Nexus, I mean, th this concept of first contact to first contract, first contract to first patient, and first patient to closure. Uh, at AdvaMed this year, the crisis in MedTech clinical trials was the name of the panel. And uh, so North America, Canada, US is similar in, in the kinds of problems that they're existing. Um, this is where we need to pull up our bootstraps and, and really optimize across the province. Uh, if we do, given the quality that we have, uh, and given the diversity of patients that we have, I think we can become one of the leading clinical trial places in the world, as we were back in 2006 to 2008. Right. Uh, but we, we need to move. Um, one of the other comments that you made uh, about getting into markets, uh, HTX recently did under their Harmony project, recently looked at five technologies going to six international markets. And just as one example, technologies getting onto the market, a single technology getting onto the market immediately in Australia and the United States, getting after 20 months in, uh, in Canada and Germany, uh, and after nine years, still not on the market in France. So it, picking your market properly is very, very important. But having said that, that we got in the market fairly quickly in Canada, sales went absolutely nowhere. And uh, Chris Shaw, if he were here, would say that he has a technology built at, you know, or developed at Western Ontario, developed in Canada. It has 30%, I'll make, I may make this a mistake, but it's like 30%, 30 of, the, of the Japanese market, 20% of the German market, and 1% of the Canadian market. And that, that's, I'm not surprised. Yeah, and, and that is, is, is really... And John, uh, that's where atrial fibrillation, where 20% of the population over 60 years old have atrial fib. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, uh, this is a great discussion. Uh, I think we could carry it on for a long time. We're, we're going to 1120, correct? 
Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, have a chance for the audience, if there are any questions from the audience on MedTech, the difference between MedTech and pharma uh, 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 initiatives or things of that nature, uh, by all means, please, uh, please ask. Okay, I have one. Um, so it was good to hear that uh, OHIC is looking at um, an innovation chair. But uh, the question here, and maybe it's the parallel, in the pharma world, we have the EO for ODB that comes in and negotiates pricing. Is the innovation chair going to actually be bastardized and changed into that situation? Because if they're looking at innovation, and innovation still costs everything you know, we talk about, you still put money aside. There's a judgment. Is it innovative or not? And if it's not, then where's my deal? And that's what happens with the EO and pharma as well, too. Yeah, I, l let me comment a little bit on that. Remember what I, what I was saying earlier, that we don't have the same kind of uh, regu uh, regulated pricing of devices and purchase of those devices. Um, one of the other things, which is a difference between pharma and, uh, and, and medtech, is that, um, uh, as, as Osterley from Medtronic said a few years ago at AdvaMed, 92% uh, of Medtronic's products were conceived by practicing physicians. Yep. Uh, and there's a very iterative process of development between medtech companies and the healthcare system themselves, tweaking, tuning, changing, and so on. The challenge for pharma is that you have a constituent of matter. It is a, it is a molecule. Uh, uh, and so it's harder for that molecule to go to, you know, for a, a, a drug developer to go to a, an oncologist, and the oncologist says, I love your drug, but it's got too high a systemic toxicity. Can you fix that for me? You know, it's, it's hard for a drug developer to do that. There are cases in imaging or other things, you know, when they say, can you improve the resolution? Can you re increase the sensitivity specificity? Those things can be done. So th there's a different dynamic between the healthcare system and development of innovation uh, in the two industries. And so uh, it's very unlikely that OHIC is going to lead to uh, a pharma-style price-based negotiation. It's more going to be, if you're a Me Too and other things, OHIC isn't, gonna isn't even going to look at it. We're going to look at those important, you know, disruptive kind of problems and 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 you know, unique technologies that can address them of high value. Uh, I've, I've been involved with the, the the panel and other things in development over the last year or so. So, John, yeah. can I add to that? Yeah, please. It's okay. So, Nick, one one of the things is, uh, John, I absolutely um, echo John's uh, um, statements about it's different than pharma. It's a bit of a different environment in terms of the process that's gone through. And if that office is put in place, we're not clear if that's going to happen or not. Yeah. We'd like to see that happen. Yeah, absolutely. But just to let you know, the conversations that have gone on at the MedTech Working Group and at OHEC have resulted in Healthcare Supply Chain Network, which is an association where hospital purchasers and employees from med device companies um, and some pharmaceutical companies that are involved in purchasing or, 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 or logistics of, of selling products, actually the association is involved with both. And what has happened just recently is because of the MedTech Working Group, because of OHEC, they went out and um, um, the Ministry of Government Services went out and gave money to the Healthcare Supply Chain Network. And they've come up with some recommendations now that are moving the pendulum from price to value of outcomes. So the journey is beginning. And that's the positive news of all this. I know John probably wants to talk about that a little bit more as well, is that there's this movement of the pendulum. What we have to do is make sure we keep it going that we actually build it and get that move. And it's the same thing for pharma, I believe. Let's stop focusing on price and the value of the outcomes, but help people develop models for doing it. Because what HSCN did is they hired Deloitte and they had them come in for four months and do a study. It's a really, really good start. And I, I urge people to look at the HSCN website uh, in a few, in a week or so, where you're gonna see the publication of what they've done. And it's trying to move the conversation rather than get to RFP, shut the conversation down. Requirements have been developed by people who don't necessarily work in the innovation industry. And so you're buying the wrong thing for the wrong reason at the wrong price. But let's not have communication. You know, that's sort of, I'm, I'm, character, I'm caricaturing it. But uh, now it's saying, no, no, no. We have to have the conversation way back to what is the problem? What's the problem with the health? What are the top 100, 100 million dollar problems? And how can we get into a competitive dialogue and discussion with industry uh, who are the best at solving these problems, and then, in fact, work in partnership towards getting solutions to the market. And then, you know, also not just the OHIC office, but you're having other associations, other bodies, the shared service organizations, everybody realizing they have to get to adoption of innovation. If our healthcare system is going to thrive and we're going to get to better patient outcomes, we've got to find a way to change the way we're doing things. And there's a, there's a mindset that's out there we find that people want to do it. We just have to help them get there. And like John's saying, industry can help with that. We can't lead it, but we can help steer it. 
Yeah. Austere is not the right word. I mean, uh, inf you know, yeah, yeah. I don't even want to use the word influence. I don't yeah. know the right word to yeah, yeah. use, but, you know. <laughs> collaborate. collaborate. It's, it's collaboration. Yeah, no, 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 it really is. Are, are there other questions? Uh, from the, yes. Zaina from the Mars Excite program. So you're preaching to the choir on all these issues, and we're certainly working on most of them. Let me play devil's advocate on Brian's last point about, you know, the opportunity cost of not doing this is, is you know, outcomes of patients. When I showed the data to some pretty big decision makers about Canada lagging on adoption of med tech, so not only relative to our peer OECD, but relative to third world countries, you know, on breakthrough technologies, we have zero adoption and they've found the value and adopted them. Uh, and then when I also showed the data that Quebec approves about 80% of drugs for formulary listing and the rest of Canada is about 40%, the answer was Quebecers aren't any more healthy than everybody else and Canadians aren't any less healthy on med tech lack of adoption relative to everybody else. So is this really about outcomes or is this industrial policy? You know something, I, I think um, 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 it's, it's more than that, it's bigger than that, but it's also, it takes time. When I say what we're seeing movement, any journey to get things going forward, we just had Health Canada come up with a policy on uh, reuse of single-use devices, which was a massive issue. It took four years. And as any policy initiative, you're talking about sparks and people seeing the light. Um, uh, and Zane, I don't disagree with you that there are a lot of mindsets that are out there that are resistant to it, but that's what advocacy work is all about. That's what about evolving policy. And what we have to do is just keep, continue to show people the light. I don't know how many times, I used to be a pharmaceutical sales rep, and the, the nicest thing you ever got to at the end of the day is when you called on a specialist selling your product and you were getting pushback, 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 and then on the eighth time of seeing her, she'd come back and say, hey, you know what you should do with your product is this, this, and this. It's exactly what you said to them. It became their idea and they went with it. <laughs> so this is about advocacy work and presenting solutions that work, because this drug did work. And I'm not talking about tricking people. I'm talking about staying the course and all of us working together to get the right message out there. Just one other thing I'd like to, to uh, talk about as well is outcomes is critical, but patient choice I think is also critical. And um, there are plenty of technologies out there that uh, are not medically necessary, uh, but that Canadians do not, all, are, do not always understand they have the choice to potentially make. One example would be just, if I can use uh, my, uh, uh, an example from my industry, is a toric intraocular lens. So roughly a third of all patients have some sort of astigmatism. And uh, if after cataract surgery, you can get a monofocal lens and you can continue to correct that astigmatism with eyeglasses or contact lenses, or you could get an intraocular lens implanted in your eye, which corrects the astigmatism and therefore reducing or even eliminating your need for glasses or contacts. Uh, I think there's frustration out there with patients that have a monofocal lens inserted in their eye and then they found out after the fact that a uh, toric lens was available and, uh, but they were never made aware of it. So I think, the, and it's an, it, it, clearly uh, it's not medically necessary because glasses will correct it and, and work just great. But, uh, but yet it comes down to patient choice and it's about educating them on what their options are and then allowing the patient to make that choice. And uh, I, I don't think Canada is as evolved as some other markets in educating patients on their choices with both, well obviously they are with insured, but uh, not as evolved in educating them on uninsured services. Vera, do you wanna make a final comment? No, I think that um I mean, if, if you knew that there was a product out there like ours, that if you're having a heart attack in the back of an ambulance and they put this around your arm and press the button, it would save 40% of your heart, I think you would want to have the ability to pay for it out of pocket if it's not reimbursed or available through the healthcare system. But, um, you know, so every lay person I have ever described our technology to says, well, when, when is this coming out? When can yeah. I use it? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, stay tuned, we're working on it. Um, but we wanna do things in a proper manner uh, so that we get good uptake, uh, we wanna educate our physicians, and we want to see what we can do about the process in Ontario. 
Uh, and, and Zena, just a, a comment, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. is, is a unique healthcare system. Uh, it's been a license to print money for, for many companies because of its uh, rapid adoption of technology, but perhaps rampant adoption of technology. Uh, however, Canada compared to EU countries uh, where you're talking about similar outcomes, but they've got much lower costs uh, and yet higher adoption of technologies. So I think we need to look uh, at a much more nuanced level at, um, uh, at those uh, various things. I'll take one last question. Uh, uh, this lady over here was waiting. I'll take one last question because I think we're over time now. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Fernanda Saraga. I'm a medical writer, a scientific consultant. One of the parts of the equation for medical adoption, I think, is the physicians themselves and clinical guidelines. So I previously worked with a small medical device company. It was in the wound care field. And um, even in terms of just publishing any kind of articles um, on case reports, things like that, it met with a lot of criticism because it's not following the gold standard clinical guidelines. But to introduce new innovation, you're going to go against some of those guidelines. So how does the physician play into the equation of industry, government, you know, adopting that new innovation? Yeah, I think they play a key role. It's a great point. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we're trying to do is work with some industry associations to develop consistency uh, within, uh, the, uh, w within ophthalmology as far as educating patients on insured and uninsured services to make sure there is consistency and appropriate education to patients. And so if, an a if a patient uh, goes to see uh, a, a doctor in Toronto or Barrie or London or wherever the case may be, there is consistency in how they're educated. And uh, I think that's critical, and we're actually working, again, with an uh, industry association yeah. to try also, to accomplish that. It's also the physicians themselves need to sort of allow for that change in the way they've done things, right? They've done things the same way, tried and true, but there could be some room for improvement with innovation, but there's some reluctance, I think, on that part. Yeah, so I said, I, I said uh, industry associations. It's, it's actually physician societies yeah. that we're specifically working with. And there also has to be incentive for those physicians to adopt new technology, which often there isn't. In right. fact, there's often disincentive for them because they get paid more to use the old technology rather than the new. Uh, any final comments? Yeah, I just wanted to make one final comment on that if I could. We have had three or four physician associations come forward to us and start talking about the adoption of innovation and how we could you know, develop a common platform for conversation. So it's about that evolutionary response. There are people out there that want, the bulk majority may not be there yet, but there is a movement afoot of people that are actually wanting to make sure because physicians are being able to see now that their choices are more limited. Here. Any other questions? Um, our product, our product is adjunct care to standard care. So you do everything that you were going to do and you add this. And how we have approached the process of clinical guidelines is we are uh, engaged with KOLs running two very large multi-center trials. It's going to be 4,000 patients in total at the end of the day. And that's going to drive clinical guidelines. So we've approached it from the Let's, let's use the momentum that we've generated with this product, and with this therapy, and with our device to, to facilitate these large multi-center trials, because without, without our device, they actually can't do the trials. It's too cumbersome to do it manually. Oops. Oops. And that was it. I think everybody <laughs> 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 Okay, well listen, uh, we're, we're over our time a little bit here. I would like to, you to join me in thanking the panel for an excellent discussion. Thank you, John, uh, Brian, Alex, Vera. That was another terrific uh, panel discussion. I think you're starting to see some of the themes come out of the day, um, despite the, uh, whether it's from the pharma space or, or the med tech space, you know, we're hearing things about the strengths of our science in, in Ontario and our ability to leverage and commercialize um, um, those sciences. 
Um, we're, we've heard about the procurement process and access to market and adoption of innovation and the importance of um, showing real leadership around this. And I think all of this uh, continues to point to um, a continuing ongoing dialogue um, with policymakers, going back to um, Maurice's comments at the beginning of the day. Um, we need to have a stronger dialogue. We need to set a common vision and goals and strategy. And so uh, that's something that we're certainly to, uh, committed to following up on um, on this day uh, through a, a white paper report and continuing engagement with both our partners, um, many of which you're seeing here today, um, as well as, as government. So um, as, as, as LSO, as representatives for the voice of um, our collective industry, we want to bring that collective viewpoint to government and strengthen um, the individual organizations like MEDEC and, and RX&D on their very specific regulatory and reimbursement policies. So uh, that's the role that uh, we would like to continue to play. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for this morning. We're going to pause for a moment and have an early lunch. Um, I, there's going to be a buffet at the back. I'd like to thank our sponsors for our lunch, which is Alcon. And Alex uh, was just up here. So Alex, thank you very much for sponsoring our, our networking lunch. Um, please, um, after I'm finished, please go help yourself to lunch. At 12 o'clock, we're going to have a uh, presentation. You can continue to eat um, your lunch during that presentation. I will be presenting alongside um, uh, KPMG, one of our partners, um, some results of a study that we've been working on in terms of benchmarking um, where Ontario Life Sciences is uh, in terms of the ecosystem. I'm really excited about this. It's been um, a long time in the making, um, and I think the findings are um, both validating as well as eye-opening. So I look forward to presenting that at, at noon. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the lunch.